morning, everybody. Would you stand this morning as we start our morning with singing, lifting our voices up to God? Many of us come in on a Sunday morning and uh, we have our own wishes and wants and needs. We do know that we can come to Him with all of those and lay them at His feet. Confess to Him, bowing to Him for any need that we have.
good morning, Waypoint. You guys can stay standing. I'm going to keep this so short. Watch how short I'm going to keep it. Well, we'll see. Uh, hey, Light the Night is coming up on October 31st, and uh, we just want to invite you to be involved. Check out our local board. We need lots of help uh, set up during, afterwards. We also need some cash donations. We're trying to hand out uh, a family gift bag uh, for a movie night, and just to intentionally say, hey, we believe strongly in families, and, uh, and to do this. So if that's something that touches your heart and you want to contribute to, please do so, uh, and make note of that on your check. Also, uh, Way of Waypoint class happens, and that starts next Sunday. And you guys, Chuck Hubbard's helping us by teaching this class. This is at 11 o'clock, so if you want to become a member, if you want to learn more about Waypoint, if you want to plug in a little bit more, uh, sharpen your skills, this is the class for you. So that'll take place over four weeks, starting next Sunday. Also next Sunday, right after second service, we're doing an Inspire, Inform, Inquire. Just a, a, a quick meeting. It'll take less than an hour, and we're, we're just going to keep it uh, short and uh, give you an opportunity to, uh, to learn about what's going on at Waypoint and ask some questions. And then finally, this Wednesday, Craft Night starts again. Uh, see you there. Uh, details in your bulletin.
guys, let's pray. God, thank you so much uh, that your grace is enough. And God, as we come together as brothers and sisters because of what Jesus has done for us, God, we worship you. And God, we, we thank you so much for your presence here in this place. God, we, we give you our lives. We give you uh, ourselves as, as individuals, as families, God, as a community. God, we, we look forward to what you're, you're going to do in and through us. And so, God, that's our invitation. Uh, that's our request today, God, that, that, uh, that you would do a work on us. Thank you so much for Pastor Kyle and for this, uh, this awesome message that you've put on his heart. God, thank you for, for your work during first service. And God, I, I pray that, that the same work would be done as you, as you speak through your servant uh, here today. God, uh, watch over us. And God, we, we just dedicate our lives to you. Lord, we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. And I want to invite the ushers to come forward as we give our gifts, tithes, and offerings. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
as we uh, transition here a little bit this morning, I just want to invite you to continue thinking about worship for a second. I want to thank Mike and the team for leading us this morning. And uh, as, we've, as we've shuffled our, our staff roles around a little bit here over the last few weeks, um, I, I've been able to think a lot, of, a lot more about worship uh, out of necessity uh, as I've kind of been you know, doing the production kind of thing of, of our worship services and stuff. But I, I just want you to ponder for a moment just the whole idea of worship and uh, what we've just experienced. Now I want you to, to just think for a second about what worship might have been like back in the Old Testament days. I mean, I don't know about you, but, but you, know, you read through the Psalms, and a lot of our songs come right out of Scripture, right? And you read through the Psalms, and, and I, can, I can kind of picture David you know, sitting out there on the hillside with his harp, you know, surrounded by his sheep as he's writing you know, a bunch of you know, songs that we're still singing today. Uh, and you know, he's, he's plucking on his harp or whatever, and, you know, and then you read, you read other places where there's lots of other instruments going on, and they're singing and praising and dancing, and I'm just thinking, man, Old Testament, they were like rocking out worship, you know, back in those days, and just, I don't think about it very often, you know, and, and if you go back far enough, you see, read the, you read the Old Testament, right, like the first act of worship, if I'm not mistaken, was, uh, you know, Abel, you know, killing one of his sheep and, and offering it up to God. Aren't you glad we don't do it that way anymore? Um, and, but, but, but then you fast forward, you know, up to the New Testament and you just think, how did Jesus worship? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, you don't, you don't see the instruments, you don't see the electric harp, you know, there anywhere, or drums or anything. You just gotta wonder, how did, how did Jesus and his disciples, was, was like Jesus doing the lead thing and, and he's got 12 guys, you know, backing him up on vocals, you know, doing the acapella thing or something? I, you just, yeah, I just wonder about that. And, and it makes me realize, though, and appreciate, appreciate what we have and uh, the work that, that goes into, you know, the, the songs and everything that, that our group prepare. But also makes me realize that, you know what, this is, this is not the sum total of worship for us. What we do between 11 and 11.30 on a Sunday morning or, or 9.45 and 10.15 if you're in first service, you know, that's, that's not all there is to this worship thing. Because God really intended for us to live in the act of worship, to, to, to live it Sunday afternoon all the way through Saturday, Saturday evening and then on through Sunday morning to be a, a part of who we are all day, every day. And one of those things that we do as, as an act of worship is that we take the love and, and the light that God has given to us and we share it with the people around us. And uh, we, we just come through a series where we are talking about our story and God's story and how we want to you know, take that and share it with other people and, and help it become part of their story. And you see this wall we got over here. It says Acts 1-8. And it's, it's full of post-it notes and everything. And I just want to encourage you to stop by that wall and, and take a look and read through some of those post-it notes uh, because those are, those are representing the groups and the people where Waypoint goes, the individuals of Waypoint where they go and they have opportunity to share God's love and his light. And I just want to read, uh, before services this morning, I just stopped by over there and I wrote down like two from every color. And I just want to read to you some of those ways that, that we are having the opportunity to worship through our lives and through passing on God's love and his light in these areas and with these groups of people. Check this out. Oakland University students is one group of people somebody wrote. My robotics team. RHS, which is Renaissance High School mentor groups, is another place that, that people are taking the light and the love. Athletics, my school, my neighbors, children at risk, my workplace, the Curves exercise facility, okay. my family, my grandchildren, the people of, of Umri, which is over in India where we've taken some mission teams, my carpool, these are just some of the places that God has given to us, our personal mission fields, if you will, where we can be representatives of our king and we can share his light and his love. And you know what? Before we launch into the, the, the other part of the service this morning, I just, want to, I just want to pause for a second and lift up everybody you know, from Waypoint, you know, the ones that have put you know, post-its up there and, the ones, and, and you're welcome to still do that. There's more post-its over there if you want to do that. Um, but just in, in our efforts in doing so. Let's, so let's just, let's just pause and give this to God. God, we just want to thank you so much 
for this whole thing of worship. It's all about you. And it's really about focusing our attention on you. And, and God, as we think about all the different ways that, uh, that we can do that, we are just praying, God, that you will help us to, to expand it beyond just what we see and hear and sing on Sunday morning. But you'll help us to make our lives a, a style of worship to you. And God, I just think about this, this wall that we've got of, of post-it notes and, and all the people that are represented up there. All those people have, have a tie back here to someone at Waypoint. And I pray that you would help in that process, in that connection, t- to, to help our family members here at Waypoint to take your light and your love to the people of their world, the people that they mingle with on a regular basis and they see so that they can, they can be seen as your ambassadors, as your instruments of grace and truth and love, God. And we just want to pray all these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning again, everyone. I'm, I'm Kyle Gerald. I am one of the uh, members of the ministry team here at Waypoint, and I often neglect to introduce myself, and, and uh, so people will stop me occasionally and say, hey, we have no idea who you were up there up front, so that's who I am. Um, and, if, and if you've been here for a while, you know that, right? And, and I hope also that if you've been here for a while, you've been tracking along with us in our, in our devotional study series. Uh, we commonly refer to it as the D6 stuff. Um, if you're new, I, I'd like to invite you to pick one up on your way out. We have a, a little devotional magazine. It's called Fusion, and uh, it's, that one's for the adults. If you're a teen or, or a youth or a child here, um, talk to the youth leader about picking one of those up um, from their department. But you're, wel- you're all welcome to them. The Fusion magazine, if you go out these doors, it's right around the corner, and there's a little like walk-up window, you know, like if you were at McDonald's or something. Right there, they're on a ledge right there, and you're welcome to take one home. They're absolutely free. Um, but... So all of the, the D6 stuff helps us walk through scriptures. And one of the things that I, that I love about the D6 materials is that it's helping us as a church walk through the entire Bible over the course of like six years, okay? And I know that that sounds like a really long time, but if you think about how much content there really is in the Bible, that's, it's really not that long. Um, but it, it, and we all walk through it together, and so we're all talking about the same things when we go home and everything. So I really like that, that part about it. And occasionally, as we're walking through the Bible, using the D6 stuff, occasionally they'll come to a segment where they say, hey, this particular topic um, is really spans several different books, so rather than looking at it from just one book's perspective, we're going to put, put several things together here in a topic and cover all of them you know, in kind of a broader scope thing. That's kind of where the series is at right now. If you've been tracking along with us, we're in this demanding question series, questions that are just really tough about you know, how how we do this, this faith thing and, and you know, questions that, that people might ask about God and what was he thinking you know, kind of questions. And so you know, a couple of those questions that's, that are in this series have been, why does evil exist? And that's one that Pastor Chris shared with us last week. Also, why does God allow suffering? Why does hell exist? And then the question that we're going to start today and then carry on through those devotionals th- throughout the, the rest of the week is, is this one. Why do bad people prosper? And maybe you've asked those questions yourself or, or maybe you know someone that, that has been or, or is asking those questions. And, and if so, I just encourage you to grab one of those devotionals, take it home, read through the scriptures and the, and the devotional thoughts that go with that. There's some really, really good stuff in there. But the question that we're looking at starting today and then, and then on through this week is this. Why is it that bad people prosper? And oftentimes there's an, there's an accompanying thought that goes along with that question and it goes something like this. It isn't fair! Right? Anybody ever had a child that said, it's not fair, that's not fair? Um, but they probably don't say, you know, why do bad people prosper? But, but, you know, the adult version of that is just that. It's not fair. Why, does, why is it that bad people seem to prosper? Um, if you've ever thought those thoughts, let me just say, you're in good company this morning, okay? Let me show you what I mean. There are, there are many um, passages of Scripture in the Bible where we see someone wrestling with this question and with this thought. And, uh, and one of my favorites is in Psalm 73. And, and if you've got a Bible, I just want to encourage you to open it up, turn to Psalm 73. We're going to be spending a lot of time there. Um, but we're going we're gonna, to, and we'll break it down into parts here. But listen to this writer's struggle as he, as he ponders this question, okay, in the book of Psalms. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And I underline that because that's one of those, uh, just grab you 
you know, and shake you for a second kind of moments. I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Here's this guy who's in our Bible. He's writing the book of Psalms, all right, and he's struggling with this, with this human, human emotion. He's struggling, wrestling with this as he's looking around. And he goes on to, to describe these people who are, are prospering, the arrogant, the wicked. He goes on to describe them in detail. Check this out. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? This is what the wicked are like. Always free of care, they go on amassing wealth. Surely, in vain, I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. All day long, I have been afflicted and every morning brings new punishments. If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. And when I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. Whoa. Nailed it. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I've had some of those very human, same kind of thoughts myself in my lifetime, okay? Why is it that it seems like the bad guys are constantly raking it in, living it up, always carefree, never getting caught for the bad things they do, while those of us who are innocent, hardworking Joes, you know, we seem to get pounded every time we turn around. Why is that, God? I don't get it. Maybe I'm living this life, doing the best I can, living right and, and keeping my way pure, and it's all for nothing. I mean, look at them. They're just way out ahead of the pack, right? If God is truly good, why do bad people prosper? That's a question that has plagued good people everywhere for ages. And I, and I think that our, our answer can be summed up in one word this morning. Perspective. Perspective. There you go. There's your answer. Let's all, we can all go home. Okay. Uh, no, okay. Seriously, though. Um, I found a few pictures out there this week out on the internet to help us start thinking about this, this, the answer to this question and the whole perspective things. I just want to share these fun little brain teasers with you, okay? So look up there on the screen. And I'll kind of explain what we're going through. All right, at first glance, it looks like a foreign language, all right? But if you read along with me, it's really not that, that complicated. Actually, let's try this, okay? Let's try all reading it out loud. Here we go, ready? When reading, it does not matter in what order the letters in a word are, as long as the first and the last letter are at the correct position. This is so because we do not read each letter individually, but the word as a whole. That was amazing. You guys, yeah, give yourself, that was awesome. That was so cool. Um, but, uh, if, you know, it just makes me feel so much better about all the typos that I leave when I'm writing my emails and stuff. So, you know, forget autocorrect. We'll just, it's all good as long as you get the first and last letter correct. Okay, so that's the first one. All right, let's go on to the next one. Okay, oh, we got the three dresses. Are you serious? No. Okay, um, so we've got three dresses. Actually, the truth is it's only one dress, you know, in three different, uh, three different lighting, you know, skip, scopes here. So um, from left to right, we have the white and gold version. We have in the middle is the blue gold version, and then on the right side is the blue and black version. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do really quick. Raise your hand if you think that this dress is white and gold. See, how many of you vote, this is a white and gold dress. I like that white and gold dress. Okay, raise your hand if you think, nope, this is a blue and gold dress. It's the one in the middle. Raise your hand. That's the one that I'm going with. Okay, um, and then, okay, not, not, we've got a couple of hands there. And then raise your hand if you think, nope, this is a blue and black dress. It's definitely blue and black. Okay, we have the most hands blue and black dress. And I think that I was told, the internet said, which, you know, you got to take that for what it's worth, but the actual dress was blue and black. So um, it's just, they, they varied the lighting. Uh, it's just totally different ways to look at the same dress. Okay, moving on to the next one. All right, take a look at this, at this girl and uh, tell me, what color are her eyes? Would you say that they are blue or would you say that they are gray-ish, on the, like on the right side, or would you say that it's one of each? The correct answer, believe it or not, is that they are both the grayish color on the right-hand side, 
Okay, and if that, that gray color just appears bluish when you put the left, I mean the, the red background behind it like that. And I even tested this at home. I didn't believe it. I tested, I, I like copied that color, you know, over to the red side, you know, like with draw paint or whatever. And, and, and it is, it's true. It's, it's the gray color. So it just, it blew me away. All right, so next one. Okay, what are you looking at here? Is it a blue cube with, a, with one corner removed, reve revealing the inside orange center of the cube? Or is it a blue cube with another smaller orange cube hovering outside, slightly rotated right in front of that outside corner? Which one do you think it is? Or none of the above, maybe, it, or is it both? Can you see it both ways? Part, one little corner removed and also, oh yeah, it could be a cube hovering out there just in front of it. Yeah, that's another. Okay, next one. Here we go. All right, this one, this one will really mess with you if you look at it for a while, okay? Take a look. What, can you, what, what do you see? What do you notice about the horizontal lines, okay? The ones that are like, you know, this way in this picture. Would you say that they, that they curve? Would you say that they go from, you know, smaller to, I mean, bigger to smaller on one side and smaller to bigger on the other side, you know, kind of arrowish kind of thing, kind of design? Or again, none of the above. I know they, they look like they're slanted, right? But all these lines are actually parallel and they're hor perfectly horizontal, perfectly parallel all the way up. Totally doesn't look like that. All right, next one. All right, what are we looking at here? This one is, this one's pretty famous, okay? There's, there's two people in this picture, right? First, I mean, first, at one glance, you might see an elderly lady, the profile of an elderly lady with her eyes, you know, almost covered with hair, right? And the second one here is you might see the backside profile of a, of a young lady looking away from the picture. Do you see them both? Can you see them both? Interesting stuff. All right, one more we got going here. Okay. See a little red and white checkerboard there with a couple lines, one at the top, one at the bottom, blue and green. Which one would you say is the longer of the two lines? The green line or the blue line? Or C, none of the above? <laughs> Correct answer is C. They are identically identical in length, okay? Totally does not look like that, especially when you're close enough like at your computer screen. It's like, no way. Get out the ruler. I'm going to figure this out. Um, it's, a, it's amazing the kind of things that we can do, just like playing with your mind with these kind of pictures. I also uh, found a short video clip out on um, the internet that I believe illustrates this point perfectly as well. Let's go ahead and roll that video clip. I'll tell you what you're looking at, okay? What you see is an amazing desktop or room decorative piece in the form of a playful dinosaur. Watch his eyes and his head and his neck, okay? These little guys have no moving parts. You're not going to believe me, maybe, but they have no moving parts. They're made out of paper or cardboard, so keep watching them. This thing blew my mind. Like I said, keep watching. Pay, pay close attention to those eyes and head and neck. Okay, now we got a bigger room-sized version. Okay, check this out. He's going to follow the camera wherever the camera goes. Pretty, that would be a pretty cool toy. I would just say, I, yeah, I'm going to have to get one of these for my office or something. Okay, now wait, wait, wait for it. Here it comes. It's going to blow you away. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Whoa! Keep watching. What? No way. That is ridiculous. How is that even possible? Keep watching. Keep watching. Bam! There it is again. It's all about perspective, isn't it? I mean, if you looked at those pictures one way, you see, you see one thing. If you look at them a slightly different way, you see something totally different, right? And that, and that T-Rex, from about 180 degrees, it looked like this cool little guy that was following you with his eyes. My daughter even said, that, that's creepy, Dad. I mean, he's just looking at me. It's like, um, but you get to a certain point, all of a sudden, you step behind the illusion, right? And you see the back is just cardboard. And you notice a couple things. There are no moving parts. It's just a... It's just a piece of, flat piece of cardboard that has actually been, been you know, bumped up and in instead of out like we normally think of something like that being in that shape. Perspective. Let's go back to our question. Why do bad people prosper? 
Let's check out a few other verses from uh, another psalm before we get back to Psalm 73. Okay, so just keep your finger there in Psalm 73, though. Um, Psalm 49 says this. Do not be overawed when others grow rich, when the splendor of their houses increases, for they will take nothing with them when they die. Their splendor will not descend with them. Though while they live, they count themselves blessed, and people praise you when you prosper. They will join those who have gone before them who will never again see the light of life. People who have wealth but lack understanding are like the beasts that perish. Perspective. This psalmist is realizing, you know what? We've heard it so many times. You can't take it with you. King Tut might have been enshrined in in pure gold. He didn't take a single coin with him. King Solomon might have been the richest guy that ever lived on our planet. He didn't take a single penny with him. Do you remember what the writer said back in Psalm 73? I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. That's the temptation that we we tend to envy those because we see how prosperous they are. But he went on to say this. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. And then there was a turning point in his life. Check out the next line of this Psalm, Psalm 73 until I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. When the writer of this psalm stepped into the sanctuary and stepped into the presence of God, God hit him right between the eyes with this revelation. This is not your final destiny. In the light of God's glory and in the light of God's power and his eternal kingdom, everything started coming into focus for the writer at, like he was stepping to the side and behind uh, that T-Rex and seeing that back ugly cardboard. All of a sudden, he started to realize there's more to life than this. Check this out. Psalm 73, and, and, it, and it, these aren't up on the slide. Let's just read through it really quick. But Psalm 73, beginning at verse 18, if you got your Bible open, He goes on to describe the arrogant who who are seeming to prosper. He says this, Surely, God, you place them on slippery ground. You You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so when you arise, O Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. And then he pauses and he starts to reflect on his own heart for a few verses. And he says this, When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Then at the end of this psalm, he flips back for a second, Getting, putting our focus one more time on the arrogant. And he says, those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. And then one last closing thought back his way. And he says, but as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge and I will tell of all of your deeds. When we are close to God, when we are near God, when we are in his presence, we start to get his perspective. We start to see things the way God sees them. As for me, it is good to be near God. A few weeks back, I, uh, I, ha- I had the task of taking our sanctuary light board to the FedEx shipping, shipping stop uh, to send it back to manufacturer because it went kaput. Okay? And uh, I, you, you might, you might have re- might remember this, but there was one Sunday when the lights were kind of funky in here, um, and it was like that was Sunday. It just stopped working. So we took it down to the FedEx store, and our wonderful tech, Mr. Kurt Clausen, he had contacted the manufacturer, and they had sent him this RMA, which is a re- return merchandise authorization form, and they said, okay, you need to put this with your light board when you bought in the original box and everything. Send it back to us. We'll take care of shipping, um, you know, we'll, and we'll cover it, and we'll get it fixed and get it back to you. Okay, so I went to the FedEx store. I put this big box weighing about 20 pounds on the desk, and I said, here's my RMA, my return merchandise authorization. You know, the company said it's prepaid. We're all set, and I just got to you know, give this to you and make it go, um, right? And it was so funny because the lady at the desk, she looked at me, and she kind of smiled, and she said, uh, I'm sorry, that, that doesn't work here. 
that uh, we need a FedEx label with a barcode on it, right? I mean, that's, and, and so, I mean, the problem was that I didn't have what was needed. I didn't, I didn't have the correct currency, right, for the FedEx store. All I had was this little RMA form, which was just a piece of paper to them. And, you know, I imagine that there are going to be people in heaven on Judgment Day, standing before God, who are going to try to buy their way into heaven or cheat their way in or sneak in or whatever other trick they had in their little bag, you know, here on earth that worked for them. They're going to try to get into heaven in one of those ways. And, and I imagine that on that day, God is going to stand there and look at them kind of like that lady did at me. And he's, he's going to say, I'm sorry, but that doesn't work here. You see, our, our earthly riches and resources are like my little return merchandise authorization form. They're worthless in heaven. The only things that are really going to be worthwhile in heaven on that day are, are what? Number one, God, right? You expect me to say that. It's a Sunday school answer, but it's true. God, God is going to be the most worthwhile thing in heaven ever, right? Um, secondly, our membership in God's family, which comes only by trusting in Jesus Christ for our salvation. And number three, the, the good things that we have done in genuine love and sincerely in God's name. Those are going to be the things that are going to be worthwhile in heaven. In Matthew 6, Jesus says this, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And Paul, speaking to Tim, writing to Timothy, um, follows up a little bit and explains a little bit more about what that treasure in heaven kind of looks like. 1 Timothy chapter 6 says this, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. And in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Let's talk about that riches in this present world for just a second, okay? I did a little research, did a little homework, and, and discovered that the median household income in Oakland County, Michigan, here where we live, as of the last census, which was 2010, so numbers might have adjusted a little bit since then, but the median household income was $62,000, okay? Which means the per capita or per person income is roughly $32,000. So, so the average person, average wage earner in Oakland County, Michigan makes roughly $32,000. Now, according to a website, uh, global, globalrichlist.com, it's a fun little website, I've used it before, get home, you can play around with it a little bit, okay, but you go to this website, globalrichlist.com, and it's just, it's really simple, there's like one blank that says, you know, put in, you know, annual salary that you want to check here, and click this go button, and you'll see where you rank in the, in the world's rich, the global, you know, the, the global rich list, okay, so, um, for example, unless you make you know, over $1.75 billion a year, I'm sorry, but you're not going to be the first, you know, and the most richest person in the world, okay? So I got to, got to beat that mark by a little bit. Um, but, so I, I was toying around. I had to find out what the upper number was, all right? So, um, so, but when you put in $32,000 a year, I found that we are in the top 1% of the world's wealthy. The average person, average wage earner in Oakland County, Michigan is in the top 1% in this present world. Now, you might not feel rich in this present world, okay? But you are. Perspective, right? Perspective. A few years ago, Carrie, um, my wife Carrie, took a trip with other ladies from our church from Mom Squad down to El Salvador to help uh, with another organization to drill a well for one village down there that had no you know, no pure drinking water, okay? Um, so, in fact, their homes had no running water whatsoever. Their water source for, their, for this village was a river that was, you know, not too far. So that's where they would go to get their drinking water. That's where they'd go to, you know, to wash their clothes and do all their cleaning. All that kind of stuff was down in the river. So the ladies went with this other organization to help them drill, drill a well. Um, half the ladies from our team helped them actually do the, the digging of the well. The other half of the team um, helped to educate the village on some personal hygiene concepts. 
you know, how to, so that we could make the village healthier, help them to, to stay healthier, and also to keep their, their new fresh water supply pure. So they worked on this project, and, and when they came home, I, my wife shared with me a little bit about her experience. Um, and she said, these are, this, this village was made up of people who, all, these families had, you know, their homes had one room, very simple homes, one room, cinder block walls, cement, or even dirt floors. And she said, and none of the, peop- none of the people in the village even had their own outhouse. You know, they didn't have any running water. So they, didn't, they, they shared a common outhouse with the other people in their village. There was only one guy in the whole village. He was the rich guy who had his own outhouse. Okay, he was the village rich guy. And, but yet when she came back, she said, I was jealous. I, I envied them. I want what they have. Now, now, before you go off thinking that my wife is crazy or anything, let me explain a little bit more, okay? Um, what she meant by that was this. She went there to do this, this, this wonderful you know, service project along with these other ladies. And when she got there, she found this community of incredibly happy people. They were happy. They, they, they worked hard every day, gave it a good hard work day. But when their work day was over, they spent the rest of their afternoon and evening in community with the other people in their village. I mean, they, were, they would share with their neighbors. They would have mi- meals with their neighbors. They would sit out on their front porch and they would talk with their neighbors. And she said, she said, we don't have anything like that here. You know, they didn't have to go from event to event, from place to place at breakneck speed every day. And she said, I was kind of jealous of them. Perspective. It's all about perspective. So if God is truly good, why do bad people prosper? Do they? Or do we just need to adjust our perspective? Listen, people who seem to prosper, the the arrogant or the wicked or whatever you want to call them, the bad or whoever you, you want to call them, they're on a very slippery slope with a very short timeline. Let's make sure that that we are not falling for, the, for that temptation to store up our stuff here when the place we really need to be thinking about is heaven. We need to adjust our perspective. And I, I got a couple bullet lines here just uh, from the scriptures just to help us to, to think about those things as we're leaving this morning. Okay, keep these, these words from scripture in mind. It is good to be near God. Don't be overawed by the rich. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Instead, do good. Be rich in good deeds. Be generous and willing to share. And in this way, you will lay up treasures for yourselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that you may take hold of the life that is truly life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is it is so easy for us to get focused on the bubble that we live in, whether it's, it's our little community or our, 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 our little world here, Oakland County or whatever, and to look around and to see the things that other people have and say, yeah, I want that, I need that. And God, it's so easy for us to be tempted to think that that's all that really matters. God, I pray that this morning you'll help us with our perspective and that you'll help us to, to step around, like stepping around the, the, the backside of that T-Rex and to see that, no, that's not all that there really is. That's, that's just a fraction, teeny, tiny fraction. And compared to eternity, it's nothing. And it's worthless. God, I pray that you'll help us to fix our eyes, our hearts, and our minds squarely on you where they need to be. We can, so we can stay in your presence and so that we can work towards those treasures that really matter. And God, as we do so, I pray that you would help those that are around us with the same thing. Help us, Lord, um, to work toward that stuff that's true treasure as we live out your love to the world around us. I pray these things in your precious holy name this morning. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for coming. You are dismissed. Have a great day.